You are listening to the Final Say Radio Show, a Rappaport Media production, with your host Brett Rappaport and co-host John Rappaport. I want to welcome Emily Goff from the Heritage Foundation. Emily, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes uh, left in the program today, and we, we'd like to take the opportunity to gain a little bit of uh, knowledge on the president's proposed budget, which I'm sure will pass. No, uh, it won't. In, uh, in fact, both the House and the Senate have already passed their own budgets. Usually the president leads the budget discussion. So back in February 4th was when he was supposed to present his budget. He missed that deadline, and now more than 60 days later, he's finally releasing his budget proposal um, that outlines his vision. And really, the, the policies contained in this vision are dead on arrival. It's a popular inside the beltway phrase here in Washington, but I think it speaks for itself. Um, he continues the same kind of stimulus that we've seen in his previous budget proposals um, at, that don't create the jobs that he promises they'll create. They only add to the deficit. Uh, and he also proposes more tax increases that rely really heavily on class warfare, so raising taxes on the wealthy in order to finance new spending. Uh, these are policies that will not pass the House by any means and would even run up against resistance in the Senate. Now, one of the biggest problems we have as a nation is that we spend too much money. And from the end of the Bush presidency, where we were, where we had budgets in you know in the high two two trillion dollars, you know approaching three trillion, we've almost approached four trillion a year under this new administration. And to me, that's a difference in spending. Uh, and so, the, you know, any common sense thinker would say, well, if we reduce spending at a rate that won't have a negative impact on the economy, we can gain a path towards a balanced budget. Does this budget do so in any way? No, it, it does not restrain spending. Um, in fact, it, anywhere it makes spending cuts, it makes up for it for spending increases elsewhere. Um, you're right to point out that, uh, you know, kind of the importance of looking at budget deficits. And even with $1 trillion in tax increases, this budget never balances, ever. It doesn't balance in the 10-year window that we traditionally look at budget proposals. It doesn't balance ever. It still has a $439 billion budget deficit at the end of the 10-year win window in 2023. Uh, so that really does speak to the fact that we're spending too much. And the real reason is so you can we can go after the president's uh, domestic spending uh, spree, for example, in infrastructure, education, the like. But really at the heart of this is something that the House budget – um, brought to the light that we at the Heritage Foundation write, and that is the need to tackle entitlement program reforms. Uh, the president makes modest changes um, that would you know, yield some savings, but not structural reforms that we need. Um, he doesn't do anything with the Social Security retirement age or the Medicare eligibility age, which are two um, reforms that actually have bipartisan support. So he hasn't taken leadership on that. He does embark on a, a small change in Social Security, which you know, there's some credit due there, but the details are still a little bit murky how you would implement it. And what he does there is uh, move towards a more accurate uh, inflation um, index. So he it would more accurately reflect to the cost of living and, and change seniors' benefits accordingly. Um, but we're still not clear on some of those details. So it, it, at best, it would be um, slowing down projected increases you're, in that spending. You're, you're but, talking um, about chaining it to the CPI. Correct, yeah. We refer yeah. to it as change CPI. Mm -hmm. yeah, now, okay, yeah. Yeah. Emily, there's, there's one big issue that I have here, which is historically they measure these things in 10-year cycles. And as you just pointed out, even based on their measurements, the – uh, the deficit spending, $5.3 trillion, is insane. But when you consider the fact that historically there's an, they overestimate the positive attributes, mm -hmm. right, just endless flowers in the garden, but they always underestimate the risks, whether it's uh, war and terrorism, um, interest rates, uh, natural disasters, uh, infrastructure, uh, and, and population aging, et cetera. Do you have an idea Have you uh, of what the historical delta is between, and this you could probably say against Republicans and Democrats, but what the 10-year cycle predictions are versus the, the delta of reality, which to me it seems like is almost always far worse than what's predicted? Yeah, man, golly, I wish I had that figure. You're absolutely right, though. I mean, I can kind of speak to the, the thrust of that. So you often hear, well, first of all, seeing the budget uh, reference to projected Medicare savings um, or cutting waste, fraud, and abuse, which sounds great um, and um, the direction we want to be going, but it rarely materializes. Spending cuts rarely materialize. Um, we know that tax increases generally uh, materialize uh, as 
you know, as the president, as, as we've seen from his proposals in the past. Um, so that that therefore the impetus should be on you know actually getting real spending cuts. And the way you do that is um, yes, decreasing some of the discretionary spending um, you know, on education and and some of the, and the federal infrastructure spending, uh, but you also need to enact structural entitlement program reforms. Um, such as changing the age for Social Security, uh, you know, retirement and Medicare eligibility that we just mentioned a second ago, that really lock in structural savings over the long term, um, and start to put those paths on more sustainable. Uh, excuse me, put those programs on more sustainable paths. Well, it's the wimpy factor, right? The uh, every it's all about I'll pay you on Tuesday for a hamburger today, and we can't, we can never break that cycle. And it, and and I think if you brought the if you took the Reagan approach of getting to the microphone and speaking directly to the people and being candid about the situation we are, I have a hard time imagining that most Americans wouldn't be happy to work a few more years if they were thinking about the impact on their children and grandchildren, especially if they were asked two or three years ahead of time, not this 20 years ahead of time, but not six months ahead of time either. Absolutely, and engaging in, in fear-mongering isn't being honest with the American people at all, um, and that would be true whether it was a Democrat or a Republican doing it. So, um, you know, we can gradually phase in retri- increases in the, in the retirement age, for example, giving people in my generation plenty of time to plan, um, and, and, you know, really the increases that we're talking about would reflect changes that have already occurred in longevity. So Americans are living longer, they're able to work longer, they actually will be able to save more, uh, you know, to have during retirement, so it benefits both the economy, having the added value of workers, and also the individual because they would have more money, um, you know, banked away for savings in, to use in their retirement. Uh, so we can talk positively about this um, and have an honest conversation to educate the American people um, and also s- educate some folks here in Washington too. Uh, but engaging in fear-mongering tactics just won't cut it. You mean Republicans yeah. hate women and old people isn't working anymore? <laughs> it shouldn't. <laughs> it's absolutely not true. <laughs> It, what's shocking to me is that we've added more people to the roles of disability and, and welfare and, and all these other social programs than we have created jobs over the, these last bunch of years. And that is creating jobs where people are paying taxes into the federal coffers is the only way to get ourselves out of this mess. <laughs> yeah, there really is this philosophy that kind of drives the president's budget, and we've seen it in countless speeches and, and previous budget proposals, is one that if the government isn't spending the money – no one else will. Uh, thus, we're all going to, you know, the economy is going to slow to a standstill and, and we're not going to, quote, pro, you know, progress at all. Uh, that's just not the case. Uh, government spends money much less efficiently than the private sector does. And if the government isn't spending a dollar, it means the private sector has that dollar to spend. Because let's remember, whenever we have government spending, that dollar has to come from somewhere. It comes from the right pocket to be spent out of the left pocket. It's not magically appearing. Um, and that's then, right. The more we borrow, that means more interest that we have to pay in our debt, and that bill just gets passed on to future generations, which if we really do care about future generations, we wouldn't want to spend more on education programs for them. We would want to pay down our debt to a more responsible level so that future generations aren't saddled with this economy-crushing level of debt. That's right. Emily, we're up at the end of the show, so I want to thank you for joining us here on the Final Say Radio Show. Uh, Thank you for uh, coming on so late in the program for us and covering these uh, issues. And uh, we love the Heritage Foundation uh, very much. And, of course, we we were defending earlier against some uh, quotes by Grover Norquist. But that's for another day. We'll keep the good research coming. (laughs) Great. Thank you again, Emily. Thanks. That's heritage.org. This is the Final Say Radio Show. Join us again tomorrow, 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern Time. And that is a wrap.